So, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming to the community dev room. Uh, we will now turn the floor over to uh, Deb Nicholson and Nydia Ruff, who will be covering companies and communities. Why can't we all just get along? Thank you. Oh, no, that thing's attached. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm Nithya, and I want to introduce my uh, co-speaker, Deb Nicholson. I think a lot of you know her. She is the uh, director of community for the Software Freedom Conservancy. And I've known Deb for quite some time. And uh, she's such an insightful person. She really works hard to connect issues and people and understand cultures. And it's a pleasure to be speaking with her today. Oh, uh, and this is Nitya Ruff. She uh, works at Comcast and runs the open source programs office there. Uh, I met her a few years ago when she was like brand new and you soaked everything up so quickly. And uh, so it's been really exciting to get to where we are co-presenting together. Um, so today we're going to talk about companies and communities. Why can't we just get along? Yep. So I've spent uh, almost 20 some years in open source, but more from a com company perspective. And it's important to understand that while open source started with uh, the community and with hobbyists and with people trying to solve problems, uh, over the last 10, 15 years or more, uh, companies are adopting open source a great deal. Um, everyone's consuming open source, my company does. And we're trying to contribute, we're trying to get involved in communities. And they're very different. Companies are very, very different from communities. They've been set up for very different reasons. And so there's clearly a natural cultural clash sometimes between companies and communities. And uh, we need to understand that in order to work better together. Oh, uh, yeah, so one of the things that, uh, that we've noticed is that uh, communities end up sort of with this problem of success. So uh, it's like, oh, we had this great, like, kind of cozy, unique thing with just a couple of people happening. And then all of a sudden, like, large companies with, like, NDAs and copyright license agreements are like, hey, can we come to your party? And it's like, we're still meeting at someone's basement. Uh, it's kind of feels weird for you guys to send a caterer, um, you know. And so, so the challenge is to kind of keep the community spirit, but uh, also be welcoming in new participants. So let me talk a little bit about the nature of companies. Um, the legal structure of a company has been set up to raise money, uh, as much money as you can from stock markets and from investors, et cetera, to create products, to sell them for revenue and to make profits. Uh, and the markets, the stock markets in particular, and uh, board of directors, et cetera, expect companies to continue to be predictable, make money, and uh, to be built to last, to kind of be long lasting as a company. And money uh, through sale of licenses, proprietary licenses or products is quite common. And companies are punished by markets if they are not consistent and they deliver on their expectations and promises and that they continue to grow. So companies are really set up and incented to make money and to grow. And then you find that uh, this need to please the markets, to deliver on expectations and to be consistent and to continue to grow then fuels the goals and the focus of the company. So everyone from the CEO and the board of directors all the way down um, is highly focused and has a single-minded focus on making sure that everyone in the company is working towards a common purpose, towards common business objectives, towards business goals, to avoid risk, to avoid uncertainty, to deliver on promises, um, and focusing on alignment across the company, across business purpose. So as an open source person in a company, Anything I do from an open source perspective also needs to be aligned with business purpose and needs to serve the needs of the company. And companies have HR departments. So they have people who advise managers, who advise people on how to set your goals, how to maximize your goals, how to mitigate risk. And the system of rewards and risks is set up to reward you for your behavior 
uh, for aligning with the purpose of the company, for helping the company achieve its success. And that then means that sometimes if you're an open source developer inside a company, you're really rewarded for contributing to projects that help the company, that help it uh, build its products faster, cheaper, better, rather than doing your own personal work or you know, following your passions or following you know, something that you want to do. And, and maybe company, communities may not understand uh, why the developer uh, is so single-mindedly focused on you know, uh, the kinds of things that he or she wants to do. So unlike uh, com com communities, the rewards and penalties uh, for developers are often uh, tied to avoiding risks, uh, sticking to their goals. In the US, for example, it's hire and fire at will, and so employees can get two weeks notice um, that either the company business has changed or that their work is not up to par, and they can be let go. And, and employees, on the other hand, also can say, I'm going to leave, and I'm giving you two weeks' notice, and I'm uh, going to move on. It's very different than communities where uh, commitment could be non-contractual. It's not based on you know, uh, giving notice. So perhaps sometimes community members disappear, and you don't know where they are, but um, it is a little looser and more voluntary than it is in a company. Right, so uh, the other difference is like, companies are, can be reluctant to let their developers form casual relationships with people outside of the company when it's not clear that that participation in open source aligns with their business goals. So um, this, uh, this can be kind of tricky because uh, you know, developers from companies may show up in communities and not really be at liberty to say why they're there or what the, you know, what business goal they may be representing, if any. Uh, so that that can be kind of it, it doesn't it sets things off on a, a funny uh, start. Um, whereas uh, hobbyists and tinkers and volunteers are like there to scratch an itch, they they don't have like an underlying business goal. Uh, sometimes they just want to hang out with their friends or they want to learn new stuff uh, or, you know, build their resume, add some, like, oh, I finally have used Perl 5, um, or, or uh, even, like, less aligned with any kind of business goal to solve a really important societal issue. Like, you know, it's, it might be, like, I want to translate this into a minority language that uh, is, is not going to make me any money, but I feel strongly that it should exist. And so those different motivations mean different priorities. Uh, and projects uh, that are community-based might never like ship or finish uh, or just turn into like a, a research kind of thing. Uh, and you know, you, you find this sometimes uh, overtly and sometimes it's a little more subtle where there's just kind of this disdain for like marketing or anything that is part of a, a finished product, like maybe documentation. Um, so this can be really tricky. Um, and then uh, the different responsibilities between companies and communities lead to like different ideas of what constitutes risk. So um, for communities, it's not their livelihood. Like if you mess it up or you miss a deadline, it's like, well, whatever, like I'll show up to do my unpaid fun time thing next week whether I miss deadlines or not. Um, and they, uh, sometimes communities don't, you know, because they feel like they're existing in this volunteer space, they can be really like, oh, all of that risk out there doesn't apply to me. Like, as if, like, something like the patent system or copyright law has no meaning once you're like, well, I'm not getting paid, so obviously the law doesn't apply anymore, uh, which uh, is not true. Um, so, uh, you know, and this, this, is, this is tricky for the getting ready to interact between companies and communities. Um, the other thing that happens is people highly identify with the project, so they don't, they don't care what happens to it when they leave. They're like, well, I am the project. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and this is really different than companies that uh, they care about bringing in new customers and employees so like the projects are designed to outlive the individuals. So, uh, you know, so this, is, this creates different responsibilities and priorities. Um, uh, communities also may have like certain uh, current or historical 
peculiarities uh, because of maybe their benevolent dictator for life has got some specific things. So this can lead to things that when companies come in, they're like, oh, yeah, no, we, you know, you can cater the event for us, but like no Coca-Cola products. Mm -hmm. Like, or, um, you know, there, there could be like kind of a resistance to things like professionalism, you know, which might manifest as like, well, we don't have to start on time. Like, you have to start on time. Um, but, uh, or codes of conduct. Uh, some companies, uh, you know, I mean, some communities have a real reluctance to adopt that because it makes it feel too formal or like the man is here or whatever. Um, and then, uh, you know, so it's, you've got this thing where it's like uh, companies are like, oh, can we, can we pay some people? Can we hire some people? Can we, like, run something with you? And they're like, Oh no, we're you know we're pure and no one is accepting money for working on this software, mm -hmm. or um, you know or uh, oh you know our benevolent dictator for life had a bad run in with company X Y Z so we'll never take their money, uh, and it's like you know whether it's like real or perceived it's like it could be like an actual like huge like policy thing or it's just like I sent my resume in 1987 and didn't hear back. So, you know, they, they, can be, they can be, like, hard to, like, guess, right? So, um, you know, and then uh, that leads to some other things with the lack of professionalism where uh, technical merit might outweigh civility as a value. Um, and, and I don't want to say this is only communities. Like, I don't know if companies got it from communities or communities got it from companies. Somehow it got contagious. Um, and so, so you have this, like, I wrote the code, so I get to behave however I want, like the, the rock star developer. Um, and, and this is not, like, good for companies or communities. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then we touched on this a little bit, but because companies push developers to behave in ways that will help them bring in new customers and employees, they want to see uh, work tied to business outcomes. And that... Uh, that might limit company participants as far as like what they can say. And so, uh, you know, it's, so I, I guess like as we kind of get ready to collaborate between companies and communities, it's, it's hard to set folks up for success when there can't be uh, as much communication as there could be. And then this is a big one. Finally, uh, money. Like companies typically have it and communities typically don't. Um, so it can get like kind of weird, like you know the the things that um, you know people people may work at one place on, or on one project, but move from company to company working on that project, which is great. But then it makes a like kind of a weird loyalty, um, and then uh, companies have ideas about what is like what produces a good ROI, and when they say like, oh, this person is on the Wikipedia article for this software, like we'll pay them whatever. Whereas the community is like, we actually need to kind of bring up folks from the ranks and you know fill the benches. Like, and also like nobody wants to work with the person on the Wikipedia article anymore. Oops. So you know, so uh, so it can be kind of tricky when it's like we want to spend, and it's like, ooh, can we tell you on what? And please don't just Google us. <laughs> So, um, so once you decide you're in it for the long haul and that there's more benefit in working together, companies and communities, um, these are a few places that we think would be good to start. Absolutely. I think it's, it's important that we work together because uh, companies are in it for the long haul and they are in open source. We've all recognized as, as company folks that uh, open source is a new way development happens and that we do need to work together. One of the areas that we all agree is that diverse teams are good. There's tons of business cases from a company perspective that it is good for business, it is good for innovation, it is good for collaboration, it is good to have people from all walks of life in a project. And I think communities have come to the same conclusion as well, that it's good for us to work together uh, and to create a more inclusive and a diverse community. Right, and a little recognition can go a long way, and not just for the coders. So, like, when we, we talk about diversity, and sometimes we mean people's backgrounds, but also, like, the tasks and, and roles that they fulfill. 
And so people need to feel valued in all of those roles and tasks. And that means like companies can't just pay the one rock star coder, uh, like consider paying the community manager and the evangelist and the people who are doing peer support. Um, it's, uh, enthusiasm is a very scarce resource. So if you've got someone who's excited to go out into the world and talk about this software all the time, like get them on the payroll too. Um, and so, uh, the, <laughs> yeah, one, one's a real dog, one's not. Um, uh, but, uh, but people like continuity, you know, when things are the same, right? That's what I was thinking here. Uh, but it helps us all to build for the long term. And, uh, you know, like making it formal when someone is volunteering on a project and doing things, uh, make sure that you have more people to work on stuff going forward and uh, less competition, more cooperation, which leads to more interoperability, which is great because interoperability can save lives even. Um, and so, uh, you know, once you've got people invested, uh, they feel insulated from like the rapid change when they don't know what's going on and the commitment to the project uh, on behalf of the company seems intermittent. Uh, it can, you know, as, as much as you can kind of make a more long-term commitment, uh, it makes people feel invested and they know that they can, you know, really get comfortable. So from a company perspective, you know, my, one of my first lessons learned was in 1998 was when I started working with communities from a company. And one of the first uh, instructions I got was uh, you need to understand how the community works and the community norms. and you need to understand how to work with the community in order to be part of the community. You can't just take your company culture and uh, you know, just expect the same to be the case when you work in a particular community. And each community differs. And part of respecting community norms to me as a company person is, first of all, respecting licenses because we benefit a great deal from the code and we do need to respect the licenses under which the code is released, whether it's doing compliance from a disclosure perspective or uh, buying a beer when I see the, the maintainer the next time at a bar, <laughs> right? Uh, I've got to uh, respect the licenses. The other thing is um, it's very easy sometimes as a company uh, to use legal means to pursue something um, because that's the way sometimes business is done in... Um, in businesses, right, in, in companies. So not to use legal means, but actually sit down, be transparent, talk, sit, uh, and work things out. And, and as Deb said before, um, API and documentation and investing in things that are not just code, that are just not product, but still improve the community, improve the product, improve how the products work with each other um, is extremely important. And more and more, I know at our company we say um, we don't tolerate brilliant jerks, so it's not just about the code, it's about how this person behaves with each other. So what we thought was, um, now that we talked about some of the norms of why we need to work better together conceptually, uh, we'll actually deep dive into some tactics and some nuts and bolts of how to work better together. So a uh, common place to start, I think, is a common platform. It's, it's understanding that as company and community, we have a lot in common, mm -hmm. as, as Deb and I do. Though we work in extremely different worlds, uh, I have a tremendous respect for Deb, and we have a common platform that we can build upon. Example is uh, code of conducts, for example. Com as company people, I know every year I have to take a class in um, the company's code of conduct. I have to take uh, an anti-harassment class. I have to take, you know, how to do ethical business class and so on and so forth. It, it kind of sets the tone for how uh, we will respect and work with each other. And to me, code of conducts allow communities to ensure that everyone feels safe, everyone feels included, and when people feel safe and when people feel a sense of support and a sense of being valued, as a human, when I walk in the door, I want to feel safe, I want to feel valued, and I do my best work when, I, and when I'm feeling like that. 
And as companies, another thing that we need to kind of think through is, um, especially if you're basing your business on an open source project, it's very easy to think of it as a source of leads. Um, that as soon as someone downloads something, that uh, that is an opportunity to upsell them uh, to something from a business perspective. And we forget that it is developers and that we need to use community norms of how to cultivate community, how to uh, cultivate volunteers, how to work with volunteers, how to recognize them, how to feel, you know, make them feel included in the project. And as a company, I also um, take very seriously that it's not just about hiring the rock star developer, uh, you know, and saying, ah, now I have influence in the project, I can kind of <laughs> move it in the direction that I want because my product is dependent upon that project. Uh, yes, code is important and we do want to contribute code, but code is not the only thing that we want to contribute. Um, for example, um, money, and we have an innovation fund, and we often look at projects that do need money, and money does help um, get things done. Second is, who doesn't like pizza and beer, right? Or <laughs> french fries and beer, uh, especially in Belgium, the beer is so good. Um, so, you know, paying for food, paying for things that make it easier to build the community and to keep people here, uh, is an important thing. I do a ton of evangelization, so my company pays me money to work in open source, to volunteer my time, to evangelize projects and communities that I believe in, and to attend events like this, um, and to host events, to provide facilities, to provide you know, any means that I can to support open source from uh, moving forward. The, uh, the piece that's been a little difficult sometimes at companies is teaching teams that mm -hmm. upstreaming is important. Yeah. And that you just don't kind of consume, modify, and then move on to your next product. And most uh, business teams are incented to finish their product and then move on to the next product. And it's extremely hard to tell them that uh, it's important to contribute your patches back and your fixes back and not to fork and to uh, make sure that everything you do gets back into the upstream and that you work from the upstream. So what we've been doing is talking about the fact that security, you can use security patches, etc., mm -hmm. and that um, you don't have to carry technical debt when you, um, you know, upstream. So that's been made easier uh, to help people upstream. Uh, another place that we've noticed is that uh, companies and maybe lawyers are kind of the last place in the company to kind of get colonized by the open source enthusiasm. Um, and so uh, looking for ways to bring your lawyers, you know, like bring a lawyer to a conference with you from your, your company. Um, that they'll overdress the first time and that it's okay. Um, and uh, they'll learn, they'll learn. Uh, so uh, there's like scale in Southern California has a continuing legal education day for lawyers to learn more about how to do free and open source software. Um, and then, you know, making the legal policies transparent and easy for engineers to work with. So it's sort of like, hey, here's a whole bunch of stuff that you don't have to come Every time you pick up a piece of MIT code, you don't have to come down to legal and, and spend a week. Like, uh, so those kinds of things. Uh, we also encourage, uh, if your company is consuming and hoping to patch back uh, and having questions about how to do that from a legal standpoint or how to work with the licenses or uh, which licenses are compatible with which other ones, we really encourage companies to ask communities uh, to help them with the legal stuff so they can get a little bit more of the context and grounding before they just kind of plow forward. Um, another thing that I think is uh, really important is, uh, you know, we, we talked about it, it's not just code, but it's like when you're doing road mapping, it definitely is not just code. You can't, you can't have the business department and the legal department and engineering come up with three plans that uh, will somehow magically merge together in two years and create a coherent strategy. The, uh, the, the thing that is, uh, you know, can be a little bit of a learning curve for companies is that like, oh, actually open source like comprises all three departments and they have to work together and the earlier they get together and start talking about making those plans, uh, the better off it is.
Uh, and it has to include you, the way that you intend to interact with the community. Like it's um, that's like that whole thing is part of the roadmap. Um, so, uh, so building a fast future together is good for everyone, but not just for today. We're kind of looking at the next steps and some of the things that I think would help us do less remedial work for you know over the next decade, um, and uh, like supporting efforts to teach collaborative models in computer science classes, so that um, you know learning how to use a, a repository and version control is just part of computer science classes now, it's, or it should be. Um, including FAST licenses into the law school curriculum and um, building business partnerships around open source and not just uh, around uh, proprietary. Um, so there are some great orgs that are already doing some of these things. I'd love to see them inspire uh, more um, you know, replicators there. Uh, but Teaching Open Source, which is a conservancy project, develops curricula for colleges to teach open source right there in the name. Uh, there's a lot of amazing work at the Rochester Institute of Technology, which has a, a FOSS minor. Uh, Carnegie Mellon's got a uh, CROSS, where they are bringing uh, students and the business world together to create open source projects. So, uh, so uh, you know, each of us could look for opportunities. Sometimes the way it starts is you just meet someone from the local school and you say like, oh, you're doing computer science or you're doing, like I could come in and, and talk one, once a semester about uh, open source licenses. I love speaking at Carnegie Mellon and RIT, good people, and Cross, yeah. And, and I, I just want to come back to um, diversity and it's, it's a big, big focus at companies and it's a big focus um, more and more at communities. And we, from a company perspective, can shift the needle, can make a difference in how we demonstrate support for communities and how we incent them to focus on better community building. So, I, I, you know, Sage just spoke about Outreachy. I think hiring Outreachy interns is a huge way companies can show support. Um, and Sage, I, I need to work with you on making that happen from, from what we're doing. Companies can encourage diverse participation in events. Um, they can send their best diverse candidates to speak at events and to you know, attend events. Sometimes we just go back to the same old list of people that we need to send to events instead of thinking broadly about who do I need to send to these events. Uh, I personally, uh, and from our company perspective, uh, when I use my sponsorship money, I love to spend it on scholarships. Uh, diversity mm -hmm. scholarships, uh, doing lunches, dinners for uh, inclusion, for welcoming new candidates into mm -hmm. open source, creating safe spaces. Um, that's the way I want to spend my money. I'm not trying to spend my money to get a keynote speaking slot uh, at an event. I'd rather spend it on uh, you know, diversity scholarship because for me as well, uh, attending an event was the door opener. Um, my, one of my first events, I got to meet you know, people like Deb and Don and you know, so many others who kind of taught me the ropes and who helped me get better integrated into the community. Okay, um, and, and it's so important to have these types of conversations. Sometimes from afar, uh, we judge companies, we judge communities as being this stereotypical view of something and we need to make sure that uh, you know, when we meet people is when we realize that uh, they're different. We're close to the end. Oh, which is all right, because yes. we're here. Um, <laughs> Ta-da! So, uh, basically, yeah, yes. more conversations uh, come with as exactly. much authenticity and, uh, and leeway, to be honest, as possible. Especially if it comes with travel funding, right? Yes, yes. Invite each other to stuff with travel funding. There are some resources. We'll put the slides on the internet. And, uh, and I, I think we blew through our question time. That's what we're going to do. We're going to come over here with the handheld mic. OK. Nick's going to come up and start setting up. We'll introduce Nick, and you guys can take two questions. Sweet. OK. And we'll need to repeat the question that the audience member asked him. Sounds good. Mm hmm OK. Lovely human right there. Question number one. Oops. Yes. Oh. <laughs>
So where does uh, responsibility lie if a big company comes along and wants to give money to a community? Um, I, I, I will say one answer, and I know Deb will have some additional <laughs> stuff to say. I think companies can help you, um, you know, handle that money uh, safely. It can help you set up a fund or something of that sort. But I know a lot of foundations like the Software Freedom Conservancy and Apache and Linux Foundation, etc., can set up a neutral organization as well and set up, you know, legal constructs and funding mechanisms such that it can be handled correctly. Uh, so one of the things we help projects that come to Conservancy with is like, hey, we just got money, what do we do? And we highly recommend that they create their own roadmap for what they would do, whether they had money or not, regardless of who it's coming from, uh, and then have them you know, look at that money and say like, hey, if you're okay with us spending it on what we were going to spend it on anyway, that's fine. But you can't cherry pick uh, stuff on our technical roadmap and get that done. We're not doing a sell patches type of situation. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question. So I'm going to turn this microphone back to our lovely speakers who are okay. not making up. And if, sir, if you wouldn't mind being loud, and then the question will be repeated. I'll do my best. Uh, so you, you alluded several times to uh, I just put here. I just put this here. Okay, yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Let me get some water. Oh, that's interesting. So the, the nutshell here is like we, we talked about continuity uh, with people staying with projects and what can communities do to incentivize maintainership. Uh, I would say the overwhelming thing that communities can do to incentivize maintainership is to get a good system of delegation in place because if your project is one person who does 90% of the things and then 10 people who wear the t-shirt to events, uh, that maintainer is eventually going to get sick of that. So you've got to figure out how to share the work. And that way, even if your maintainer does need to step away for a little bit, it's okay. When they come back, there's something to come back to. So that's my thought. Uh, an additional thought is uh, succession planning uh, is important. And then from your perspective, I know companies need to give notice if they're going to move on from one product to another pro project and, and pull their developers off a certain project. They need to make sure to uh, tell the community before they leave and, and make sure that there's some yeah, options for it. Yeah, I want to Excellent. So many thanks to Deb and Nithya.